This morning's scripture is 2 Timothy 1, verses 1 through 18. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank God who I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with your joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, grand, grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which in you through the laying on of your hand, of my hands, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, for, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we, po we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed to herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet now I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you heard from me keeps as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phagellus and Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Annas Sepphoris, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. Terry, if I can't pronounce it either, I'll just point at you, and you can say it. I just want to say thank you for being here yesterday. Whether you put up a canopy, you helped hold on to a canopy as it was blowing across the parking lot. If you served chili... If you cleaned up balloons, or blew up balloons, I say thank you. For those that work behind the scenes, thank you. My guesstimate, preachers count whatever you want to call it, I'm looking at about 400 people that were in our parking lot yesterday. Some of those people, hang on, hang on it's, it, all glory gives to God, not to me. But the, the thing that we are trying to do is trying to make an impact in our city. Not just an impact in our city, but our impact in our nation. But I wanted to say thank you on that. There are others that we all celebrate birthdays. I'm not going to mention their names, but you have the ability to find those people because I might be called in an emergency elders meeting if I, if I do. 
But I want you to find those people and say happy birthday to them. Because we are trying to make a positive impact. We are trying to encourage each other. And we're here to lift each other up. Positive, not negative. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for loving us, for caring for us, for always being there for us. To be the refresher that we need in, in, in times whenever we need it. May your words be my words. And your thoughts be my thoughts. As we go into this time of study. Lord, we love you and it's through your son that we pray. Amen. The one way you can have an impact, and everybody wants to have an impact. If I say the name Corky Boyd in this congregation, what does that name? Funny, hilarious. Didn't know the man, but I know of the man because I've heard stories of you. Because he made an impact on this congregation. Not only did he make an impact on this congregation, Whenever he moved to Will's Point, there is a street named after him. It's called Love One Another. It's practical, it's tangible, and it's an example of what things look like. If you look at the book of 2 Timothy, that Timothy chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is in Rome and he's writing from prison as he mostly does a lot of the times. This letter is filled with emotion because he knows that it's probably the last letter he will ever write. He writes this lesson to his son in the faith, Timothy. And every word drips with passion, especially these in 2 Timothy 1, 15 through 18. If you have your Bibles, please read along with me. You are aware that all of those in Asia turned away from me, among whom Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for they often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you will know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. My guess is that whenever I say the name on a, on a yes, I wrote it down phonetically. I need to stay to my notes. On a Sephoris, everybody was like, is that a disease or what? I said, no, he's only mentioned twice in the New Testament. And you didn't come here today to hear a lesson on him, the man who served a refreshment. But Paul had been in prison before in Rome, but the first time he was in a house arrest, house arrest, which he was in his own house under guard. And he was expected to be released, and he was. This time, he's not in a house, he's in a dungeon. This time, the only release he expects is from the, this prison is from his mortal body. Later, he was to write 2 Timothy 4, 6. 
for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. The prospect of dying for Christ did not discourage him. Do you know what did? The prospect of dying alone. Several times in his letter, Paul mentions that, that he's being deserted. Even names two guys, Phygelus and Hermogenes. We have no idea who they are except that they have been recorded in the, in the Bible and throughout history as two people who let Paul down. Paul expected to walk, to walk his own cross. He didn't expect to walk alone. Some of you are feeling, know what that feels like. Some of you have had times in your life when you were in a dark place and the people you thought would rally around you avoided you. So Paul did what I think any of us would do. He started to make a list in his mind. He started counting the people he knew he could count on them if they could be there. First was Timothy, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says he knows that he's about to die, but he writes and says, it would mean so much to me to get to see you one more time. Later in, in that letter, he says, do your best to get to me before winter because Paul didn't know if he would make it that very long. He says in chapter 4, verse 19, he says, There are two of the dearest friends that they have been through a lot together. If they were there, they would have showed up. Priscilla and Aquila. And there's that, na that name again, Onesiphorus. What had this little known disciple done to make such a big impression on this well-known apostle? One translation says, he often visited and encouraged me. Another says, he cheered me up many times, or he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. That word refresh means to cool by breath. Every mother gets it. I remember whenever I was a kid, I would fall off my bike because I tried to be evil Knievel. How many of you remember evil Knievel? Thank you, all two of you. I tried to be evil Knievel and jump off, and I landed on, on and ended up scraping my knee. But what did mom do? She said, Aubrey, you'll be all right. Blew on it, and I went on my way. For the same reason, that's always made it feel better. What is he saying? What is he saying about honest, sir? yes, that, that guy? He says, this guy is a breath of fresh air when I needed it the most. Maybe he brought food. Maybe the food that the, in the Roman dungeon couldn't be very good, just like high school cafeteria food. And if you work in high school cafeteria, I'm sorry. Maybe he brought blankets. Maybe he brought news of how the churches were doing because Paul would have cared. But he, the most important thing that he thought of was he was brought was himself. Because the most refreshing thing to know is that there is love out there that you can count on. So it came to remind Paul that he was loved, that he was significant, 
that he was impending on death was not in vain, and he came often. We don't need to make light of that because we remember Paul is about to be executed. He is there. It is this that man comes and regularly visits someone who the government in power says he deserves to die because of treason. How many of you remember the Tusk, the Tuskety, uh, Tusk, the Airmen, the Red Tails? Okay, if you, their main motto, their, their main thought was no matter how bad it gets, they will stick with you. And that was on Aniferous. We know very little about him, but except that he was a big deal to Paul. What he, what he did with little notice should make us notice. There's two takeaways. The first one is no Christian or no person should ever have to struggle alone. Let me repeat that, church. I don't think you heard it. No one, no Christian should ever have to struggle alone. Why do so many people do? The difference between the church and the world is that the world operates around an organization and that you know that in an organization there are levels of importance. Not every member in an organization is deemed equally valuable, like the president as opposed to the, the custodian. There are different levels. But that's not true in the church. In a body, every member, or in an organism, in every body, every member matters. Jesus is the head of his body, the church. He makes the ministry of refreshment seriously. Let me show you some of his last teachings. The parable about the sheep and the goats. Parable meaning is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. He talks about the sheep and the goats and he, and he separates the goats from the sheep for eternal judgment. And here's why Jesus says so. Matthew 25 verses 42 through 43. He says, For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Please note, their failing was not a lack of Bible knowledge nor a lack of morals. It was a lack of refreshment. Jesus takes that personally. Because when you ignore the new commandment, Jesus says you break the first commandment. You cannot say you love God because you did not love the least when you could. At this point, we need to be careful of pointing at somebody else and wondering why they don't pay attention. First of all, no one should struggle alone. Second, every Christian should be his brother's refresher. This is no matter of being gifted. It's a matter of being obedient. It's not a matter of being gifted, church. It's a matter of being obedient. Serving refreshment is every single disciple's assignment. Even when you have nothing to bring but yourself, you are bringing the most important gift of all. 
Proverbs 17, 17. He says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. That's who we're supposed to be, church. That's taking our lives together in Christ seriously. You've all, you've all been around. You've all gone through struggles. You've all had experiences. And you can remember times that you felt alone. But there was always that person that was always there to pick you up. Even the person that is always picking you up needs a refresher. Amen? You don't have to, be a, you don't have, to have a, a graduate degree in counseling to be a refresher. You don't have to be have a big church budget with an organized ministry with a bunch of deacons in charge of it. But it does take something if you all if you're always giving something. Here's what it takes, church. You ready? It takes unselfishness. Because the world operates on the principle, what will I get out of it in light of what I put in into it? What's the big thing there? I. What am I going to get out of this? And there's a lot of kids going, what am I going to get if I do this for you? What are we teaching our kids? It's all about me. Jesus says, it's not all about you. Will I get more back than what I put in? What's my return on my investment? This is how the world thinks. But followers of Jesus are not of the world. They are part of a different kingdom and that works on a different principle. On an effort, refresh Paul, when Paul wasn't in a position to give anything back. Well, you say, Aubrey, I don't do hospital visits. It doesn't do anything for me. I wish I would have quoted Paul whenever he says in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, love is not self-seeking. It's why every week we take some bread we take the cup and we remember it's not about me. It's how we think. Because even the king didn't think that way. Or there wouldn't be a cross to be remembered. It takes unselfishness to be a one another kind of follower. Not only does it take unselfishness, it takes awareness. One another people are always thinking search and rescue. Paul said when he was in Rome, Oniphorus searched very hard for him until he found him. He couldn't go to Google to look at Paul's name. He couldn't go on the internet into the Roman prison registry. He'd have to go from, dungeon, from one dungeon to another to another until he finally found the place where they were keeping his friend. It took effort. It takes intention and attention to be a refresher. You need to come to the assembly every week with your eyes open. You need to pray that God will give you the sensitivity to be aware of what's going on around you and the people that are around you. You've got to be willing to make the first move. So many people are waiting for, for people to come up to them to talk to them. That ain't happening, folks. 
You've got to be the one that makes the first move. Let me say this. If you try to become a better people person, there will be a few stumbles. But I would rather receive an awkward attempt at refreshing than no attempt at all. Not only does it take unselfishness, not only does it take awareness, but it takes humility. When Paul was in the dark, dank, foul, filthy, smelly dungeon, and some surely some Roman guard said, you have a visitor. Do you think it mattered to Paul that his guest wasn't famous? When it hurt the most, all you cared about was that someone cared. Remember, in the upside-down kingdom of God, the people that seem to be the least are actually the greatest. Not only does it take awareness, not does it take unselfishness and humility, it takes courage. He knew, Onesiphorus knew, that the risk that he was taking, refreshing a condemned man. In fact, did you notice that every reference to him was in the past tense? It was at least possible that he was arrested and condemned for befriending such a traitor. A serious one another life is not for wimps. It takes courage to be a one another kind of Christian. Because the one reason you refresh people in pain is you're willing to take some of their grief on yourself when you leave. One another people are the bravest people in the world because cowards don't carry crosses. Onesiphorus was may not be remembered by many, but I think a lot of us would would like to be remembered for the kind of thing that he did. How many of you know the name Jim Joyce. All one of you. Jim Joyce was a professional Major League Baseball umpire. And Armando Galarraga, who played for the Detroit Tigers, in 2010 season knows Jim Joyce very well. Because Galarraga nearly became the 21st pitcher in Major League history to throw a perfect game. On June 2nd, 2010 against, at that time, the Cleveland Indians. There was a place at, there was a play at first base. The runner was out, but Jim Joyce called him safe. But Jim Joyce knew that the runner was out. He took that chance away from Galarraga to be that 21st pitcher. Two years later, Joyce was planning on, he was on his way to the field. It was 90 minutes before game time. 
and he sees a Diamondbacks food service employee collapse. He was a breath of fresh air to her. Because whenever she collapsed, she stopped breathing. And he, 90 minutes before first pitch, gave CPR to this woman. He'll always be remembered. For his mistake. But at least a few people will remember him as being a breath of fresh air. Here's how it works in the kingdom of God. And this is what I want you to hear. Jesus doesn't remember your mistakes. None of them. Because they're erased and they are forgiven. But he remembers every time, every single time that you refreshed. Because as he said in Matthew 25, whatever you did for the least of these, you also did for me. That's all the notice a kingdom person needs. Brothers and sisters in Christ, How many of you want to become a refresher? How many of you need help being a refresher? Jesus has called us to be a refresher. I don't know if you've looked lately. But outside these walls, there's a lot of refreshing that needs to be done. I don't know if you've looked lately, but there's a lot of people in these four walls that need to be refreshed. There's a lot of people that are still online, that are online watching now that need to be refreshed. Who is going to be the one that will step up and say, I am going to honestly be a refresher? Because I've been a Christian all my life. What have I done? Just because you come into this building, just because I sit in a garage does not make me a car. Just because I come in here on Sunday mornings and on Sunday nights and on Wednesday nights does not, church, make me a Christian. Your life has got to be changed. You have got to be that refresher. You have got to be the positive in a darkened and dreary world. Church, you've got to stand up and be Jesus. Because whenever I stand before God on that day, I don't want to be the one that, I don't want to hear the words, depart from me. I want to hear the words, what? Well done. Well done. That's the refresher. That's what we should be looking for. If you have, 
If you're saying, Aubrey, I, I'm trying to be a refresher, but I need help. I need help from the prayers of my brothers and sisters. I don't know if you don't tell me, but here's the thing. If I'm a good refresher, I should know because my eyes are opened and my, I see. If you need prayers from your brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the time. If you say, Aubrey, I'm ready to take that step, and I'm ready to put my Lord on in baptism. I'm ready to follow. I'm ready to be the refresher that Jesus has called me to be. The water is ready. I'm ready. God's people are ready. God is ready for you to follow him. Don't let people... Die alone. Secondly, don't let people die without knowing who Jesus is. This invitation does not come from me. It does not come from the five elders that we have here. It comes from God. Brothers and sisters, let's be that refreshing. Let's be the refresher that God has called us to be while we stand and sing.